Hello and welcome back, royal family. No, it's not my house. <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to say, he's in the new house. I'm not. <laughs> I'm at my son's house over in St. Pete. We had a little bit of a delay with our house. This was our target weekend. This was our target weekend to get moved in there. But the electric company is so far behind with all the new construction. They haven't hooked up my electric, but everything in the house is pretty much ready to go. Um, I think the landscape guys come on Monday or Tuesday and put some, they roll out some lawn on my front yard and everything. And, and they maybe do some touch up paint on the kickboards on the interior, but it's good to go. Just keep your fingers crossed and pray that the electric company finally hooks up a meter to my house and hooks me up electrically. So the inspector can walk through and give me a certificate of occupancy. But we decided since this weekend, nothing's happening. We wanted to drive over to the west coast of Florida near the Tampa St. Petersburg area, St. Pete, and visit my son. This is actually his, um, his house that him and it, he leases and he runs his, his own uh, program out of here on YouTube. Look for him. You'll see him occasionally make a comment on my page. It's called Financially Fit. His channel on YouTube is Financially Fit. And not because he's my son, I'm telling you, if you want to get free um, financial advice about stocks and banking and savings and stuff like that, that's his gig. And he gives it out there and throws it out there free. He's actually developing a couple of uh, channels and a couple of things on the internet. So look for him on YouTube, Colton Betes, Financially Fit. So I'm in his studio. I'm not in my house. So I think we're ready to roll. Today's title is Your Lamp is your lamp shining now? It is the 19th, 12, 19, 21. We're closing in on the end of the year. 12, 19, 21, lesson 405 of the Matthew series. Is your lamp shining now is the title. I don't have a lot to pray for. Um, I'm a little out of my sorts here in my son's studio at his house. So we're just going to jump right into the message. I appreciate everybody who sent me emails of support recently. Uh, we're heading into the new year and we're going to do a Christmas message, obviously, this coming week. And then probably shut down for a few days, take a, maybe a week off or four or five days off. So I'll let you know that. We'll probably do a Tuesday message this week. And maybe a Wednesday, Thursday type of message, which is going to be a Christmas message. And after that... I'll be moving into the house at some point, I'm assuming, and I'll need a few days off and we're going into a holiday like that. So we'll end up shutting down for maybe four or five days and then we'll um, open back up in the new year. So I'll let you know that this week. Stay tuned for all of that information. So let's jump into it, okay? We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. We're going to get back in there. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed because we know in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all may grow in respect to our salvation. We need to take a moment of silent prayer right now to get filled with the Spirit. First John 1 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us, 1 John 1, 10. We know that. We're going to jump right into it, wash the sin from our life, get filled with the Spirit, and get ready to jump into the Word of God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. The Father... We thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we just ask you to touch those believers that have been lifting this congregation up this past year. Father, we know we're small, but I believe we're mighty going forward, Father. I'm just asking for your, your hand on this move into the new house. There's so many last minute details we're just waiting on, Father. If you could just get us across that goal line, Father, it's your time and your way. We're just praying for that. We're praying for your healing hand with vaccines and viruses across the world, Father. We're praying for those that are struggling out there that are listening to this message or may stumble across this message. And it's the Christmas season. And we know, Father, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ in December because that is the month that we have chosen 
but we know it does not matter the exact time or date that he was born, Father, but we want to celebrate his birth and anybody right now struggling in this time of the birth of Jesus Christ, Father. We're asking you to put your healing hand on them, Father, during this time. Lift them up, elevate them, bring them closer to you during this time, Father. We're asking for all these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Matthew 25, 5 is where we're going to pick it up. Matthew 25, 5. It take me a little bit to get my feet underneath me here, but we'll jump into it. Matthew 25, 5. Let's read it and jump into it. Now, while the groom was delaying, they all became drowsy and began to sleep. Matthew 25, 5, we touched on last lesson, and we looked at analogies of the church age believers, the bride of Christ, and the rapture of the, the bride of Christ, I showed you. We also noted that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as the groom, is the final authority on when he comes to get his bride, his timing, and when he arrives at his wedding banquet, second advent we're studying, both the rapture and the second advent happen very abruptly. Those are two things they have in common. Very abruptly, the rapture and the second advent. With almost no warning other than historical trends, meaning the things happening all around you, historical trends that Jesus taught us about in his teaching in Matthew chapter 24 and now getting into Matthew chapter 25. Verse 6, Matthew 25, 6. Let's keep going forward. But at midnight, Jesus said, there finally was a shout. Behold, the groom come out to meet him. Matthew 25, 7. Then all those virgins got up, the ones sleeping. All of them were lazy, fell asleep. They faded a little bit. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. Now, the original language in verse 7 tells us the word trim. Cosmeo is the word cosmeo means to put in order. Trimmed means to put in order, to be organized, to be ready, to adorn something and prepare it for glory or arrange it for honor. Let me say that again. The word trimmed you're looking at, verse 7, cosmeo means to put in order, to be organized and ready. Responsibility. To adorn something, to prepare it for glory or arrange it for honor, set it up, for honor and success, elevate it, lift it up, prepare it. This points to a subject I have been led to hammer home to my congregation in the past month, I'd say probably two months, and it's the R word. Many of you heard me say in the last six to ten messages, responsibility, responsibility. This was an important position, and there were expectations to be a lamp bearer Somebody in charge of the lamps, these young lady or ladies are in charge of the lamps, lamp bearers for the wedding party. It took responsibility. It was an important position. You had to take it serious. Let me get my wits about me. Here we go. Matthew 25, 8. But the foolish virgins, unbelievers, said to the prudent ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Matthew 25, uh, 9. We're going to take a good look at Matthew 25, 8. There's a couple of, really two principles I'm going to highlight today. However, in verse 9, Jesus goes on to say, the prudent ones, believers, those prepared, answered, no. There most certainly would not be enough for us and you to go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. You have to take personal responsibility. Matthew 25, 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. We'll get into that very soon. Matthew 25, 11. I think most of you know that analogy. Yet later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Again, we're going to look at that. And I think many of you know what this speaks to. Matthew 25, 12. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you, though you claim to know me. Lord, Lord, we've covered this principle before at the final judgment. There'll come a time when many will scream, Lord, Lord, we used your name. We did this. We did that in your name. We're believers, Lord. We're teachers. We're leaders. We're part of your church, your bride. And we're part of 
the believers, and yet you will find out they are not. I never knew you. I do not know you. Matthew 25, 13. Be on the alert then because you do not know the day nor the hour. We do not know the day of the hour of the rapture, and they do not know the day of the hour in the seven-year tribulation that Jesus Christ is pointing out his second advent when he arrives. The oil we have established points us to what? The filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God circulating in the soul structure, the lamp of the believer, two power options, are really the oil we can look at in the lamp of the believer, the soul. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, royal family. Philippians chapter 2. I don't have my regular, what has he got here? He gave me, oh my gosh, what do I have? A Tom Brady Tampa Bay mug? Oh man, I'm going to have to hide that over here. I don't have my regular mason jar of ice water. My son left me with a Tampa Bay He's a, he should be a New England Patriots fan. Even though he is, he's become a Tampa Bay fan. Let's not get into that. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, royal family. We need to look at two principles today, as I was saying, that Ma uh, Matthew 25, uh, verse 8, points us to look at. First, is that as a believer, your light should shine at some point. As a believer, this isn't to drop a guilt trip on you or condemnation and all this kind of stuff. But there is going to be some Holy Spirit conviction in this lesson. I can tell you right now. We need to look at two principles today related to Matthew 25, 8, where the Spirit led me and what it clearly states. And it points us to what? First is that a believer, as a believer, your light should shine at some point. Your faith in Christ should be glaringly obvious at certain junctures in your journey here on earth. Certain points, certain junctures, there should be no question that your light shining is a Christian light. God does not expect you to spend every day as the perfect shining example of Christianity. That's not what I'm telling you. He has called you, all of us, to grow to spiritual maturity. And at certain points in our Christian walk, we should be the shining light to a lost and dying world. Perhaps in an intimate setting with your circle of family and friends or very publicly, a public display. I don't know what he's going to call you to do at what points. Either way, you were called to be a light bearer. You were called to be a light bearer, holding that lantern, that light of your Christianity with that power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the word shining because you're applying it. A light bearer. Second is that you as a born again believer cannot Listen to me, moms and dads here, husbands and wives. You cannot, as a born-again believer, take responsibility for another person's salvation or either, even another believer's walk with God. You cannot take responsibility for that. Be very careful. I know parents have a hard time with this, husbands and wives. You evangelize and present the truth with compassion, but you cannot be responsible for another person's growth or their salvation. I'm going to say that again because it's very important. God does not expect you to spend every day as the perfect shining example of Christianity and he's going to drop a lightning bolt of discipline on you when you fail. That's not what I'm saying. He has called us though. You can't ignore your responsibility. He has called us all to grow to spiritual maturity at certain points in our Christian walk. We should be the shining light to a lost and dying world, perhaps in a very intimate way with family and friends or in a very public display, he may use you at times as well. Either way, you were called to be a light bearer. You were called to shine that light. Either way. Second is that as a born again believer, you cannot take responsibility for another person's salvation or even another person's Walk with God after they become born again and saved. You cannot inject yourself into somebody's spiritual walk all the time. You cannot take responsibility for the unbeliever who is not saved. And you cannot inject yourself into a believer's life consistently thinking you're going to force them to grow. You evangelize. You present truth. You lift up the fallen believer when you can. And you use compassion as always, but you cannot be responsible for another person's growth or another person's salvation. You cannot. Mothers and fathers, that's to you. Your adult children, 
can only do so much. Husbands and wives, same goes to you. All believers are called to grow in God's grace and knowledge after salvation. That's a simple, basic part of the plan of God for all believers. Every time somebody says, I don't know what the plan of God is for my life, learn the basic before you worry about your personal sense of destiny. That'll open up to you later. God can't give you your personal sense of destiny, your personal private plan, until you're ready. You have to get the basic plan of God, and you have to grow. The basic plan of God, I always tell everybody all the time, just worry about the basics. What is that? All believers are called to grow in God's grace, knowledge, and after salvation. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Rick? I can give you a list of scriptures. I got a few on the board. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, 2 Peter 3.18. Ephesians 4.15, Colossians 1.10, 2 Corinthians 4.6, and on and on and on. Old Testament and New Testament. That was always the call for anybody after salvation. That growth develops fruit, and that becomes visible. That becomes visible. All believers are called to evangelize and touch this lost and dying world in some aspect or another at different points. Maybe not every day, a perfect Christian. That's not what we're teaching here. But at certain points, you have to develop some maturity and momentum and touch out to this lost and dying world. Yet we each take responsibility for our own walk with God. Please, as I always tell you, take a note, understand exactly what I'm telling you, and think about these principles. Because sometimes parents have adult children or those that are 17, 18, right on the cusp of becoming independent adults and they still want to try to take responsibility for that child's salvation and that child's walk with God and there's only so much you can do I'm not telling you to give up I'm just letting you know they have to make these decisions deep within their own soul structure their own lamp their own soul be careful not to inject yourself constantly in somebody else's life this is the same call all believers have bar none even pastors and church leadership are called to live in these exact same principles. Well, I think my gift as a pastor teacher, or I want to be a church leader, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. Do you have the basics down? Have you been growing in God's grace and knowledge to a level of momentum and maturity where God can use you? Because if not, then you're never going to find out your personal plan that God has just for you, your personal sense of destiny. Get the basics down. Grow up. I'm called to study and teach. I know for certain. I'm called to study and teach as a pastor. But I cannot force anyone to believe upon Christ. That's not a pastor's teacher's calling. is to force somebody to believe or grow up. I am called to study and teach as a pastor. But I cannot force anyone to believe upon Christ or make any believer grow into maturity. I can't make somebody do something. Not my calling. Really, and the best way to describe it is the way I heard it years ago from my pastor. And he used a couple of descriptions. One was a chef. And then later on, he said, I'm more of a waiter. I just bring the food to you. But a chef, I, I think, is a good example of a pastor teacher. God the Holy Spirit owns the restaurant. God the Father, God the Son. God the Holy Spirit is the one that buys all the groceries. He sets the menu. He tells you, this is a, uh, an Italian restaurant. You have to cook this way. You, as the pastor, are a chef. But you have to follow the leader of the restaurant. The supplies that they buy, they give you. The menu they tell you. They tell you to put this out or put that out. Then you put that out there. If people want to eat it, digest it, it's up to them. That's my call. You need to find yours. That is between the person and God, the Holy Spirit, working in their life. The Apostle Paul teaches very powerful principles in Philippians chapter 2. Most of them related to occupation with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You guys are going to Philippians chapter 2. Most of that chapter is related to occupation with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Meaning you occupy your mind and your time. Your time, talent, treasure goes into a relationship and understanding Jesus Christ. He teaches them about the doctrine of the hypostatic union in verses 7 and 8. That's not our lesson today. And he teaches all believers the basic principle that our new nature is Christ-like. At some point, we need to reflect that nature in a fashion 
that touches the lives of others in a very profound way. Again, not condemnation, Holy Spirit conviction today, folks. Philippians 2.13, pick it up in verse 13. Philippians 2.13. For it is God who has that work in, in you, uh, the Apostle Paul is teaching them at the church at Philippi, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Nothing to do with your good pleasure, his. If you allow God to work through you the right way and you open yourself up, and you're willing to adjust to the justice of God regularly in your life, you will find he will work in magnificent ways in your life. Ways that you could not even fathom 10 years ago, five years ago. But you have to allow him to work his plan in your life. It's for his good pleasure. It's his plan. Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining and arguments, meaning get rid of that flesh. It's exactly what that says. Philippians 2.15, so that you will prove yourselves to be ginoma. Many of you have heard this before. I'll teach it again. Ginoma, you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of matter-of-fact statement, in the midst of matter-of-fact statement, get used to it, a crooked and perverse generation. I think that fits today. It probably fit back then. Among whom you appear as what? Couch potato Christians? Dull Christians? No. Lights. There it is right there. The lantern, the light. Lights in this world. Ask yourself that question. Do you? This means historical impact, folks. Because the believer has grown into maturity. It's a journey. It's a relationship. Grown into maturity. You can have some historical impact. Get on my... This Greek verb means you have come out on the stage to be visible. That's how it was used in Greek theater. You have to come out behind the curtain on the stage and become visible. That's one of the ways it was used. It means you're part of history. It's something others will see. You're not hidden away in the dark. Something on the stage, the spotlight on you, as they would say. That's what it really means. It means historical impact. You're visible. The light shining comes from your union with Jesus Christ, not your flesh. Philippians 2.16 Holding firmly the word of life so that on the day of Christ I could take pride because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain. Did not run in vain nor labor in vain speaks to are you wasting your time? Are you spinning your wheels inside the cosmic system and doing nothing for the plan of God. You know, when you hear a, a, a term like historical impact, people say, what can I do? I can tell you right now, and this isn't, you have to understand, this is not me trying to boast or anything like that. I can tell you right now, there are people that elevated this ministry the past year in three or four ways, whether it was financially or physically or promoting things online or doing things or being positive believers, habitually following the word, that have elevated this ministry and therefore these messages keep going out and I'm going to be put in a position where I can actually put some books together and keep teaching messages and keep moving forward and the word is getting out there. And it's getting out to places maybe you don't realize. Maybe you don't realize. But I can tell you, I've had contact from Africa, the Philippines, um, Mexico, Canada, Australia. That's historical impact. And people are going to say, well, that was just you. That's not me. That's you. I can't do it without you. I can't do it without God, obviously, the Holy Spirit working through me, my union with Christ. But I can't do it without you. You're having historical impact, you positive believers. And I listed you guys not that long ago. It's not the 230-something people you think that are on YouTube. It's a small minority, but what a powerful little group they are. Philippians 2.16, holding firmly the word of life so that the, on the day of Christ, I can take pride because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain. I don't need to shy away when the time comes at the Bema Seat Judgment. Many believers, sadly, Many believers will have a moment of shame at the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ after the rapture of the church. They will be revealed as either couch potato Christians 
That's one of my sayings. <laughs> or babes in the word who never grew beyond salvation. A lot of believers are just babes in the word. They're still sitting in squishy diapers, if you know what I'm saying. And they've been born again and saved 10, 15 years. And they're still sitting at some denomination or church somewhere not growing at all or not applying what they're learning. Then there's always the couch potato Christians that kind of come and go and they don't really get involved in anything. There are winners and losers in heaven. I tell you that probably every eight or nine messages I throw it out there. There are winners and losers in heaven. There's not equality in heaven. There's bliss. There's happiness. There's no more sorrow. No more tears. All joy. Pain is gone. But there are winners and losers. There is rank and file in heaven. Welcome to Social Justice 101. Biblical social justice. How's that? All believers are given the same opportunities. All. We're all equal at salvation. All believers are given the same opportunities to have a brilliant lamp that shines bright for others to see, which means historical impact. It's that simple. Or do you hide your lamp? Mark 4.21 tells us what? And he, Jesus, was saying to them, a lamp, your soul structure, what you give forth is not brought to be put under a basket. Are you? Is your Christianity under a basket? A lamp is not brought to be under a basket or under a bed, is it? Jesus asked. Is it not brought to be put up on the lampstand, up on high, shining, everybody to see? That light guides others in darkness. Does that light have a purpose or is it showing off? A light on the lampstand isn't showing off. It's doing its job. It's shedding light so people can see in the darkness. Jump over to James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2, royal family. These are questions you need to ask yourself about your own life. Each of us take responsibility for our own light, our own lampstand, our own shining forth, our own fruit of the Spirit. James chapter 2. Your light shines not from the power of your flesh, but from the power options, two of them if you've been with me, of God the Holy Spirit and the Word, which is only found within the supernatural union of mankind into Christ. I'm going to say that again. Your light shines not from the power of your flesh, and it's not shining on a lampstand to show off. But your light shines not from the power of your flesh, but from the power options to of God the Holy Spirit and the Word, which is only found within the supernatural union of mankind into Christ. That's where it's found. It is the narrow gate of faith alone in Christ alone that opens up these two power options for all believers. It is not forced upon you, and you can reject his word after salvation or fall for the counterfeits, but ultimately... All will be revealed in the end. All will be revealed. Your light shining onto this world is a reflection of Jesus Christ. And it is what we call the fruit of the Spirit being manifested in your life. It comes out naturally. It's not forced. It's not from your flesh. And fruit is singular. But there are plural many fruits from that tree. All believers are justified at salvation. Yet... There is a higher or secondary justification which sets the spiritually mature believer apart from others. Plain and simple. That is what is being explained by the brother of Jesus in James chapter 2. That is what's being explained. And keep in mind, James is pre predominantly addressing Jews here. James 2, 19. Let's pick it up in verse 19. James 2, 19 on the board. You believe that God is one. You do well, Jews, that you at least have half a step towards the right kind of faith. But the demons also believe, and they shudder. He makes an analogy here a lot of people lose sight of. Judaism does not believe in Jesus Christ. Their creed of Judaism is one God, the God of Israel. They got a half a step towards salvation, but it's not done. The Divine Father, they understand that. They believe in that. That's what he's saying here. Demons understand fallen angels, demons, demonic beings understand the concept of God and his power, but it all means nothing without the unique 
God man, Jesus Christ, who died upon that cross and then was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. The Jews have faith in the God of Israel. That's great, James, Jesus' brother say, that's great, you're about halfway there. <laughs> the Jews have faith in the God of Israel, but they do not fully understand the Trinity. Real Judaism doesn't understand the Trinity three in one. The whole concept of Judaism is belief upon the God of Israel and then adherence to rituals to get into heaven. If you break it down, I know there's probably somebody that follows Judaism that's going to argue, but I'll tell you, Judaism is recognition and faith in the one true God of Israel, the Father God of Israel, and then follow certain Jewish rituals and you'll get into heaven. Just like the fallen angels, Judaism rejects the Messiah. That's what's being uh, put side by side here. Judaism and the fallen angels, the demons. Why is it? Because just like fallen angels, Judaism rejects the Messiah. The demons have rejected Jesus Christ and they have passed the point of no return. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand why we were created to resolve an angelic warfare from eternity past. The demons have rejected Jesus Christ and they passed the point of no return. Once man's history began in the garden, eternity began for angels. We can look at it that way. Human history began with the creation of Adam and at that point, eternity had already begun for the angels. Human history is to prove that Satan's appeal is all based on deception and counterfeits that is why they shake and tremble and shudder. They know what's coming. Let me say that again. Understand that. Human history began with the creation of Adam. At that point, the judgment was done. Eternity really already had begun for angels. Certainly fallen angels. Human history is to prove that Satan's appeal trial, his appeal, whatever he's doing to finish his argument is all based on deception and counterfeits, and that's why they shake and tremble. They know what's coming down the road. James 2.20. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Now, we're going to get into principles I've covered before, and you need to really understand these. Many denominations and pulpits twist James chapter 2. But are you willing, verse 20, to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless. The faith has got to be the right faith. Amen? I told you that before. The faith has got to be the right faith, which will then, in turn, open that believer up to a lifestyle that will set them apart from unbelievers and even weak believers. If that faith is right and it turns into a lifestyle issue, I'll show you. This is not about human good and works programs, not about works of the flesh. Contrary to what some churches may teach you about James chapter 2. James 2, 21. Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You need to really understand these concepts. Pay close attention if you haven't studied this with me before. It's very important. Isaac was a young man at this historic point. Now, there are historians and scholars that argue that Isaac was 14 or 12 years old, but there's many, and I'm of the belief as well, that he was well over the age of 18, possibly into his mid-20s. There are some that say he was 30 years old as well. So Isaac was a young man at this historic point. Abraham was born again and saved long before Isaac was even born. So if you've got a young man that's about 20 years old or 19 years old or 25 years old and the father, Abraham, was born long before he was, Isaac was even born, what are we talking about here? Was not our father not justified by works? This would go against all the teaching of everything else in the New Testament if you don't understand it. He was already justified at salvation. We all are. You were too. Abraham did not put Isaac on the altar for salvation. That happened well over 30 years prior to this event. Already done. 30 years prior to this event. Already born again and saved. Abraham 
had finally reached a level of maturity that set him apart. That's what we're looking at. A justification related to spiritual maturity, again, reminding people there are levels, there's no equality in heaven. You are at a level of a babe when you get saved and justification is imputed to you at that moment with all the grace gifts of God at that moment of salvation. But you're still a babe. We all were right after salvation. Your focus was on Christ. That's great. You don't get saved any other way. Your focus was on Christ. The object of your faith was the person and work of Christ. You understand that? Faith is not blind. Contrary to some secular saying, faith is not blind. Not Christian faith. Faith needs a target. Needs a bullseye. As you grow, that faith increases and now you anchor deeper into faith and understanding of the whole Trinity and the Word of God as well. I'm going to say this all again. You are at the level of a babe when you get saved. And justification happens. It's imputed to you with all the grace gifts. There's about 40 grace gifts that happen like that at the moment of salvation. Justification is one of them. But you're still a babe at that moment. Your focus was on Christ, which it needed to be. The object of your faith was the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's how you got saved. Faith is not blind. It needs a target. Faith needs somewhere to go. You got to have faith in something. As you grow, that faith increases. And now you anchor deeper into faith and understanding of the whole Trinity and the word of God as well. That's where Abraham's at. Abraham's faith was shining like that bright lamp when we, when he... He, not we, willingly tied his son to that altar. Abraham's faith was shining like that bright lamp when he willingly tied his son to that altar. Because Abraham's faith was so strong at that moment, it touched the life of Isaac in a very profound way. Isaac went on to become a mature believer because of what happened that moment of time. And we read about it today. That's called historical impact, amen? Amen. That's called historical impact. It affects more than you. It goes out in history and touches some lives. That's historical impact. James 2, 22. And you see that faith was working. You need to understand that word too as well. With his works, soon or get, oh, with his work. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Now, if you don't pay attention to this closely, you're going to start looking at works and not understand what's going on here. You need to understand the team effort here. Abraham had reached a level that not only God anchored his life, but the word of God itself was his trusted companion. He's no longer a babe in the word. Abraham had reached a level that not only God anchored his life, not only that faith in God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ anchored his life, but the word itself Hey, he became like a trusted companion, somebody you can trust and have faith in and walk alongside with. That's where he was at. The faith is working with something. You need to understand that. The faith is working with something. The Greek verb sunogeo, you see on the board, points us to teamwork. That's where the rubber meets the road. Teamwork. This means a dual power source it comes from a root word that means companion or a team member. It takes two to tangle, as they say. This comes is a dual power, dual power, two, a dual power source. It comes from a root, a root word that means companion or team member. In other words, if somebody's not there, the other person on the team, it doesn't happen. The faith is the key or the lead partner. But it takes both to achieve this higher level of justification or elevated righteousness. Let me grab a drink and think about what I'm telling you. This James chapter 2 can be taught from legalistic people and it confuses a lot of believers. The faith is the key or lead partner. But it takes both to achieve this higher level. It's an activity you have to do. A higher level of justification or elevated righteousness. Simply put, 
There are levels to your spiritual growth. Simply put, there are levels to your spiritual growth. There are maturity levels that place us in a position that resembles the life and work of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so brightly and accurately that it is incredible to see and few reach those levels. Again, we're going to do a lot of repeating today. I think it's important to understand. Script, simply put, these scriptures, if you understand them and you really understand the concept, who he's speaking to, really a group of Jews James is writing to, but it's for all of us. But you have to understand not only the historical uh, context, what's being said in the original language and how this all fits together, because otherwise you'll be on a works program. Simply put, there are levels to your spiritual growth and there are maturity levels that place us in a position that resembles the life and the work of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so brightly and accurately that it is incredible to see, yet few reach those levels. Few. You see a few in the Bible. Abraham, Job, Peter, Paul. We get a handful. David that reached these kind of levels of maturity, which means their faith was working so strong and they were applying the word of God accurately, meaning for us today, filling power of the Holy Spirit, that they were able to go forward and there was divine work being done, not human work. James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness because he believed God. His faith is what saved and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Relationship, there it is right there, not religion, relationship. James 2, 24, you see that a person is justified by works, not by faith. Now you understand what he's saying. He's emphasizing something here. Faith was made perfect because it did not work alone. Perfected because it did not work alone. Faith that salvation is increased in spiritual growth as the believer gains momentum and becomes intimate with the Trinity. You have to start understanding God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and interacting with them in very intimate ways, the Trinity. Over time, that faith, if it is active with the two power options, bring forth maturity after a period of time. Fruit of the Spirit, which will flow from the believer's life at certain points. Therefore, the lamp will shine brighter than others. Grab a drink and I'll say it again. Repetition is your friend. I'm going to start chewing on some ice cubes. I have a habit of doing that. I don't know how many people do that. I do that sometimes. Faith was made perfect because it did not work alone. You need to understand that's what's going on here. Faith that salvation is increased in spiritual growth. There are levels, folks. Spiritual growth as the believer gains momentum and becomes intimate with the Trinity, understanding everything. Over time, that faith, if it is active with the two power options, brings forth maturity. That's what's in view here. Fruit of the Spirit, which will flow from that believer's life at certain points. Now, you may go up and down. That's spiritual life. What are you going to do? David was on a high for a while, maturity. He made a mistake with Bathsheba. He went down low. He came back up again. You see that in many believers' life. But that maturity starts to come, gain momentum, and the fruit of the Spirit starts to flow naturally in that believer's life at certain points. Therefore, their lamp will shine brighter than others. Again, no equality in the spiritual realm. Because we all do what we want to do, amen? Free will, free will decisions. Faith can be made perfect because it begins to resemble who? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ more and more over time. What are you saying, Pastor Rick? My faith can become perfect. My justification, righteousness can be taken to levels? Yes. Faith can be made perfect because it begins to resemble the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ more and more over time, not working from your flesh and emotions, but living habitually in your union with Christ 
and his mind as your mind meld to one. His mind and your mind meld to one. The pressure and challenges are what brings out your faith. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that one. Doesn't, it's not a fluffy, feel-good message when you tell people pressure and challenges are what will bring forth your faith. It will put muscle on your faith. It will show you where you stand in your relationship with God. Abraham had the greatest pressure right there that we witnessed. And his faith, coupled with his application of the word, raised him to the highest level. That's what you witnessed there in James chapter 2. Abraham had this great pressure put upon him. God was putting him in a pressure situation. And his faith, which was already there for a long time, was growing and growing. And now he was going to see it at its peak. He coupled that with the application of his word, trusting that God was in control. He knew God's word. And he probably thought one of two things. Either I'm going to kill my son here and sacrifice him to God, and God's going to raise him from the dead. Or secondly, God is going to do something supernatural in this moment of time, and we know he did. The ram in the thicket. Abraham, he understood God's essence, his personality. He was that close to God, which was applying the word. Abraham had a long journey with God. He did. And at this point, his lamp was glowing so bright, it shines for all of us to see in the year of our Lord, 2021, we're talking about Abraham and that altar with Isaac right now. And that high level of maturity he hit where his justification and righteousness went to another level. We're talking about it today in the year of our Lord, 2021. Again, historical impact. Abraham had a life of failure and success. If you look at it, doubt and powerful faith, like all of us. Ups and downs. Welcome to the Christian way of life. This week was great. I was a spiritual giant. Next week I fell on my face. Oh well, dust myself back off, get back in the plan, get habitually moving forward, and I'll hit those peaks again. Abraham had a life of failure and success, doubt and powerful faith, many ups and downs. It culminated here to set him up with incredible historic impact for all believers to see. Incredible historic impact. We're talking about it today. James 2.25. We've got about 10 minutes left. In the same way was Rahab, the prostitute, not justified by works also when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Look at the question he's asking. James, look who James is using in verse 25. <laughs> James uses the father of the Jews, Abraham, and then a Gentile prostitute, to give an example of this type of faith by works. What an example. Talk about polar opposites. Isn't that wonderful? Why is that wonderful? Because it shows you God uses all shapes, all sizes, all kinds of people in his plan. Amen. Nobody's better than anybody else. Those who apply his word and grow to these levels become the shining lights. Doesn't matter who you were five years ago, what you did. James 2.26. Yesterday's gone. You better focus on today. James 2.26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Divine works, folks. That's what we're looking at. Divine. Divine actions and decisions in the new nature, motivated by what? Bible doctrine. Bible doctrine. Sadly, many pastors and churches use this as a way to shame people in their congregation into human good and deeds of the flesh. Shame. They use shame and guilt and they'll cherry pick maybe something from James chapter 2 and put you on a works program. Should be doing that, brother and sister. If you're not doing that, you're not spiritual. Are you really born again and saved? Be real careful with that stuff. Divine works is important. Divine actions Decisions in the new nature, motivated by what? Bible doctrine. Two power options. Can't get away from them in the recent series I've been in. Sadly, many pastors and churches use this as a way to shame people. Use their congregation for human good, deeds of the flesh. They get them to do something. But obviously, they're not doing it for the right reason. So it counts for wood, hay, and straw gets burned up if they're a believer. Turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to quickly read through Acts chapter 8 as we close. 
Acts chapter 8. There is never a time that a believer can gain any level of maturity or momentum in God's plan when they are in the flesh. No way. There's no momentum. There's no level of maturity if you're in the flesh. God rejects human good, human works. He rejected it at the cross. Works programs, human good, it's all rejected. He only accepts that which is done in the nature of who? Jesus Christ. Because that comes from divine righteousness that the world cannot manufacture or manipulate. Yes, there's counterfeits, but a counterfeit is not the real. A counterfeit is fake. It's a fugazi, as they used to say in the New England mob back in the day when they looked at a diamond or something that was a fake. Fugazi. God rejected human good and works programs. He only accepts that which is done in the nature of Christ because that comes from divine righteousness that the world cannot manufacture or manipulate. Though they have some interesting counterfeits done by Satan and his fallen army. If you're spiritual enough, you'll see through them. When you study the real, that's how you know the fake. You study the real, like that's what the FBI used to do back in the day. Study real money so you can see the fake. You don't study a whole bunch of fakes because then you're going to be confused. You accurately study the real and you'll see the fake. Let us close with a brief look at Simon the Magician. Many of you know Simon the Magician who wanted the quick fix and reliance upon others to guide him in his spiritual walk. Remember Philip was the one who first dealt with him and then Peter came in and dealt with him. Acts 8.18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given, now he just became born again and saved, not that long prior to this. Acts 8.18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he didn't understand the faith concept yet, even though he became born again and saved. He offered them money because you have to have faith. The laying on of hands wasn't the big issue. Lesson for another day. Verse 19, saying, give this authority to me as well. I want power. I was, a, I was a magician and a philosopher and highly respected. Now I'm a Christian. I want all that same stuff. Give me this authority to me as well. So that everyone whom I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Like he's doing it for others. He's doing it for self-glory. You cannot buy your way into salvation. You cannot buy your way into salvation. Or you cannot buy the gifts of church leadership either. I'm going to tell you that. That's real important. A lot of people think, well, this guy's a smart guy. He's a nice guy. He seems to understand the Bible. He's a pastor. If God the Holy Spirit didn't touch his life with that gift, he's got no business. He could be a genius. Has no idea. It's not for him. You cannot buy your way into salvation. You cannot buy gifts of church leadership or any spiritual gifts. And you cannot manipulate the plan of God by having others give you spiritual things. Others give you spiritual things. It doesn't work that way. Acts 8.20, but Peter, the apostle Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could acquire the gift of God with money. Any aspect of the plan of God is never bought. That is why any teacher that says he's a grace-based teacher had better not put price tags on things. Be very careful of that. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could acquire the gift of God with money. Acts 8.21, you have no part or share in this matter for your heart is not right before God. No part or share in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Notice the Apostle Peter is clearly stating that Simon the Magician had wrong motivation. And even though he had just became born again and saved, he was right back in the fleshly attitude, the fleshly part of his soul. Right back in it. The dog returning to the vomit. That's what God looks at. What's going on in here? God looks at always, he always goes layer upon layer, much deeper. God looks at that motivation deep in your soul structure. He looks at what you think about. What motivates you? Where are you pulling this stuff up from? Where is, what is your mind set upon? What's your time, talent, treasure? You're putting it into things, but where, where is the root of that? 
That's what God looks at. Acts 8, 22, Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, the apostle Peter warns, and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart will be forgiven because evil is a lifestyle. All sin is not evil, but all evil is sin. You understand that? When you really break it down, I've explained it to you. Evil has to do with a lifestyle, habitual, over and over again. Simon had needed some serious change in his life. He needed a crash course of doctrine and a lot of cleansing because evil is more of a lifestyle issue. You need to make some serious changes. You need to make, it's not just name it and cite it and think it's no big deal and keep moving forward. That's for a sin when you stumble during the day. Evil is a lifestyle. You need to make serious changes. Therefore, repent of this wickedness, verse 22 of yours, and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart will be forgiven. Acts 8, 23, Peter goes on to say, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. This is a lifestyle. This is deep in your soul. And in the bondage of unrighteousness, this is evil, the difference. Though Simon was now born again, he went right back into the ways of his flesh. And listen, I'm going to give you a little hint. If you got born again and saved, and there's some portion of a lifestyle evil, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's something else, that's in your life, you don't give up. You stay in the Word, you keep naming and citing the sin, washing it clean, getting away, pushing away from all the secular garbage that gets you into trouble. You have to push away from it. And you have to start changing your lifestyle. And you need to really get on a crash course of Bible doctrine. That's the only way. It's a journey. I'll tell you that right now. Simon was born again, but he went right back to the ways of his flesh because he was struggling with a lifestyle issue. It's an evil issue. That takes time. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cherry coat, uh, 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 you know, uh, cherry pick something and, and make it sound fluffy and feel good. It's difficult. It's difficult. Listen, there's a reason that addicts and alcoholics go to meetings and start changing things in their lifestyle. They need to. And God wants you to do that. Get around other people that are sober. Get, listen to some positive things. Get in the word. Do the right thing. That changes. Those are lifestyle changes. Acts 8, 24. But Simon answered, I'll take responsibility. I've got some work to do. I'm going to get into the word. No. Acts 8, 24. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, yourselves. Pray to the Lord for me, yourselves, mom and dad, husband and wife. Help me with this spiritual thing. Take it, take it off my chest a little bit. Give me a little hand here. So that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. No responsibility. He never takes responsibility for his own walk with God. He wants the apostle Peter to fix that problem for him. Doesn't work that way. That might not be what you want to hear from your pastor, but I am academically honest. And I can only tell you what God the Holy Spirit teaches from his word and tells me what to say to you. He wants the apostle Peter to fix the problem. How many adult kids want mom and dad to fix the problem? How many husbands want the wife to fix the problem? Wife wants the husband to fix the problem. Or best friend wants the other friend to kind of fix this problem for me. Be very careful of that. Again, I bring up the R word everybody hates to hear lately, responsibility. The believer should reach a peak at some point, whether it's 20 years into your walk, whenever. We all grow at different rates. The believer should reach a peak during their walk with God where they have historical impact in their circle of family and friends, Maybe it's in their community. Maybe it's in a congregation. But you can't keep that lamp under a basket. Maturity brings forth fruit. No other way to put it. Maturity brings forth fruit naturally in your life. You don't have to force it. Also, every person, and this goes for believer or unbeliever, believer or unbeliever, will be accountable, will be accountable for their own decisions and walk with God at the end of their lives. Everybody is going to be accountable. Nobody gets away with nothing. You ever heard that one before? No one can give a person salvation or spiritual maturity. That is the distinct commission and work of God the Holy Spirit. Working with each individual's own 
soul structure, their own lamp. God, the Holy Spirit, working is already working. So if somebody didn't believe, it's not because God, the Holy Spirit, called in sick. It's because that person is negative. No one can give a person salvation or spiritual maturity. That is the commission of God, the Holy Spirit, working with each individual's own soul structure, that lamp that we have been studying. I thank you for your time. We will have some messages this week related to Christmas. Look forward to it probably Tuesday and Thursday. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.